So, I know a lot of you have been anticipating this one since it is by and large the most popular of the Zelda series. Whether it is the best or not, of course, depends on individual opinion. But there's no denying, let's be honest with ourselves, this game really basically launched the new era of Zelda, for, for good and for bad. And was pretty damned well received when it first came out. I want to talk about one of the big reasons why I think that is. Complete and utter luck. No, I'm serious. Hear me out. The N64 was beaten to the launch release by the PlayStation 1. The PS1 came out, and initially, Zelda 64 was actually supposed to come out earlier. The PS1 came out first, and they were like, oh crap, you know, we've already lost the race. And so instead of pushing, and in a rare moment of, of a Nintendo corporate actually doing something smart, Nintendo, Nintendo corporate backed off and said, okay, take whatever time you need. We're not going to beat the PS1 to the market. Do whatever. And uh, so because of the delays in the PS1 and its launch, I, I'm, I'm skipping a few details because this has more to do with the PS1's creation and the fact that they're originally going to do this on the disc and blah, 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 blah. The point being, because of various completely lucky circumstances, development on, on Zelda 64 was pushed back. And by pushed back, I mean given more time. They never stopped working on it. The initial uh, version that was ready to go at that, game, at that point in time was probably going to be a much worse game overall because it was basically rushed. But now they're like, oh, okay, take your time. And they did. And they came up with Zelda 64, a.k.a. the Ocarina of Time. Some people refer to that as the Ocarina of Time. Uh, some people call it the Ocarina of Time. I tend to vary my pronunciation. I apologize for those of you that bothers. I don't do it on purpose. <laughs> I usually call it Ocarina or just Zelda 64. Uh, for simplicity. But I find that interesting because it's really indicative, I think, of the balancing act all developers have to do. We need time, but we don't want to be rushed, but we don't want too much time. There's like a middle ground. You give a developer too much time and you have Daikatana. You give a developer too little time and you have, well, a dozen games I can name right now, but Dragon Age 2 comes to mind immediately. You need a nice sweet spot of actual time to work and massage and really make the game flush out. So, I think they did two really, really smart things with this. For those of you not know, who are not aware, Zelda 64 is actually based on the Mario 64 engine. In fact, it is effectively the Mario 64 engine. They were originally going to include a jump button for the move to 3D, and after some decision, they decided not to. I know this is probably a controversial mention, but I actually agree with that. I think the contextual sensitive commands and the Z-targeting were really both very, very good ideas and really helped uh, add to the combat, add to the smoothness of it, and were a good way to shift from what had up until then been an entirely 2D face-down gameplay into full 3D behind-the-shoulder look. Uh, really excellently done there. The... Uh, I just have a bunch of thoughts about the gameplay in no particular order here. Um, this game also has basic... I've talked about this before. Uh, Ocarina of Time was basically the first game to really have really just amazing dungeon design uh, with thoughts towards continuance. In other words, in basically every dungeon, I think in literally every dungeon actually, uh, there's a point at which you do something, move something, change something in the terrain of the dungeon. That means if you save and quit, or if you die, and you re-enter the dungeon... That thing is now a shortcut to get further in. You remember how he mentioned back in Link's Awakening and in the, uh, excuse me, the Oracles games and in uh, uh, Minish Cap, both, and all of these games, there was literally a warp thing that just sent you further into the dungeon. I like the Ocarina approach better, and several of the Zelda games from now on will be using the Ocarina approach of building the shortcuts into the design. It, it's smarter design, basically, and it requires more work, and I usually reward uh, and, and, and are more positively inclined towards that kind of approach. Um, so that's awesome. Uh, now I will say this, I've been praising the game, and I will continue to praise the game. Let's talk about a negative here. The movement on the N64 is pretty squirrely, uh, similar to, to Mario 64, ironically, and the camera control is really, really squirrely, and it takes some serious getting used to. I have a lot of props and uh, uh, respect for the people who speedrun this game on the N64 version because I can barely play the game on the N64 version. For those of you not aware, I was actually playing the 3DS version for this rumination. I felt it was the definitive version of the game, and I stand by that statement. Let's go ahead and talk about why. Uh, number one, the most obvious reason, the fixing to the controls in the camera. 
I mean, the graphics could have been exactly the same, and I still would have probably bought it for those two things alone, because the camera is way smoother, and the controls are way, way more smooth, way more responsive. There's a lot fewer of, no, I'm trying to go this way, damn it, moments for me. And so, for it, just to use a really, really mundane example, you know in the very first town in... Uh, in the Kukiri Forest, there's that town, and you have to go across, you go up a tree trunk, and then you go across a bridge, and then do a hard left, and go across the bridge to get a couple rupees. Almost every time I play that on the N64, it is an actual challenge for me to stay on that bridge because of the, the squirrely movement. Um, by contrast, on the 3DS version, no problem at all. Um, a part of that is because of the removal of the 8-point system. Part of that is just because of more responsiveness. Shrug. Of course, they did also improve the graphics significantly. Um, I infamously remember someone who actually commented on how, oh, the graphics look exactly the same. And I was just laughing at them. This was when this first came out. I just couldn't help but laugh at them. And they were like, what? And I was like, okay, dude. <laughs> See, my friend and I, when it had come out, when we actually had the copy in hand, we had, it was his 3DS, he had the 3DS up, and he held it up to the monitor, and he pulled up a uh, video of the intro of Zelda 64, so he could compare it side by side. And it was night and day. This is in addition to the fact that they didn't do it the lazy way. See, a lot of scenes in Zelda 64, the original, the N64 version, are actually set on effectively a 2D texture. You know, it's just a picture, and there's actual... Uh, collision designed on that which the which the character can move around and interact with but nothing's actually mapped it is literally just a painting that you're moving around on think, think ff7 if you don't really get what i mean by this um in zelda in in the 3ds remake most of those areas are actually made into 3d areas they're actually rendered there's actual mapping and and, and uh, meshes and then the textures are wrapped onto those meshes like you wouldn't have proper 3d circumstance the fact that they went to that effort alone really shows that they actually cared about this remake. Now, unfortunately, there's not really a lot of new content. There's basically none. Uh, there's the addition of the hint stones, and that's basically it. And that is a bit of a shame. But I will say this, I do still consider this a proper remake, if only just barely. Because of the increase to the, uh, the, the, the smoothness of the controls the smoothness of the camera, and the, the effort put into not just making the graphics look prettier, but actually redoing the graphics in many cases, basically completely starting over with it, uh, with a new engine and everything. So just my take on it, of course, uh, it is at the very worst, in my opinion, a very, very good port. Now, um, the explosion of popularity. So this, this is hilarious. Uh, this is, of course, arguably... The most popular Zelda, I already mentioned that. Um, even more so than the original, The Legend of Zelda. This is, I, I actually talked about this back in FF7. I believe the reasons why FF7 is the most popular are basically the same reasons why Ocarina of Time is the most popular. That particular era in gaming was a new dawn for many people because at that point, up until then, for the most part, for the most part, gaming was still kind of a niche thing. Video gaming especially. Uh, was still kind of a niche thing, and you know some people were still just getting used to the idea of it. It hadn't really hit widespread media yet, not not in the same way that it has nowadays. I mean, nowadays gaming is is a standard uh, bread and butter kind of an industry, but back in the day, you know, it was still eh. now with the PS One and the uh, and Okara and the N sixty four both came out. We had yes, I know the Dreamcast, <laughs> but the, when those two systems came out, it was it was a completely different concept. They they were marketed like crazy. And it had become a little more acceptable in most cultural circles to like them, and most of the people who had been growing up on video games, on the Ataris, on the Commodores, on the NESs, on the SNESs, were now old enough to actually have an influence on popular culture rather than just being kids. So people who were now adults, or young adults, were, were accepting of video games, and then that's when this comes out. So there's more buying power behind it, there's more of a push behind it, etc., etc. This is very standard, uh, really. Uh, this is like completely 101 uh, generational marketing right here. I don't think it was done deliberately, don't mistake me, but that is exactly what we're looking at. So, you know, all, the, all those initial games on the PS1 and the N64 were hugely popular because of the era of gaming, if nothing else. I'm not saying they're bad games, by the way. But what I am saying is when a new Zelda was announced on the N64, people went wild for it. While the PS1 was braving and charting new territory, and props to them for that, Nintendo and the N64, let's be honest, the N64 was not actually that much of a success 
long term wise. Its library was very limited. They didn't support it quite the same way they should have, and arguably it was probably Nintendo's biggest misstep, other than the freaking Virtual Boy, which we don't even talk about. However, a lot of people were hungry for iteration games. What I mean by this, you know, some people like to make the joke, oh, each Pokemon is the same, each Zelda is the same, each uh, Assassin's Creed is the same, yada, yada, yada. Um, and, and, and I've always said that those comments are entirely dismissive because they ignore the actual meat and substance of the matter. Now, there are certain games out there that basically each new game is very, very similar to the previous one. Uh, most of the, uh, the Madden and the FIFA games are a good example of this. However, even in those cases, someone who is actually into those games will tell you, well, no, this is different, and this is different, and this has changed, because you need to actually be connected and attached and care enough to actually invest yourself in the game to know that there's differences. What I mean by this is a lot of player players were already invested into Mario, already invested into Zelda, and so these p play players were interested, invested to the point where they would look at Zelda 64, and even though Zelda 64 is basically an iteration of Link to the Past, because it is, it was still a great iteration. Some of you may not understand what I mean by this, to, 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 to explain a little bit better. For all intents and purposes, structurally speaking, you know, ignoring story for a moment, you could see Zelda 64 as a remake of Link to the Past. They took the same formula, same basic idea, and improved it. This is what Bethesda's been doing for years. This is what Blizzard does a lot. You take something that already exists, and it's like, okay, well, let's build on that, let's polish it a bunch, and let's create something new out of it. It is a, a iteration on the same idea, right? So, <laughs> Zelda 64 came out at a time when a lot of players were like, oh, you know, we, we really want a new Zelda, a, a, a Zelda game, a classic Zelda game, but one that takes it to the next level. And I'm sorry, but there's really not many people who can deny that Zelda 64, Ocarina of Time, really was taking it to the next level, even if it was definitively a Zelda game. You understand where I'm going with this? The other thing I want to talk about, though, there's a couple of other really nicely done things. Uh, first of all, the music in Zelda, uh, in Ocarina of Time is just phenomenal, like overall. That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, it's actually funny, though. One note I like to point out frequently. Listen to the song that plays over the opening. Do, 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 do. Now play Mario Brothers 3 and use a warp whistle. I just find that funny. Um, but in all honesty, I just want to talk about the sound design for a moment. Uh, forgive me because I don't actually know the name of the gentleman. But there's a gentleman out there who is blind and uh, got into contact with, uh, oh, dang, uh, Runner Guy. Runner Guy. I had to think about his name for a moment. And uh, he, he's a speedrunner who speedruns uh, Ocarina of Time, uh, among other things. And he got a hold of Runner Guy, and he was blind, but he wanted to enjoy Ocarina of Time. And as of this year, that gentleman has actually successfully completed Ocarina of Time. Now, if you don't understand what I mean by this, this is a person who is blind who cannot see, who has beaten a Zelda game. Now, you might ask, why am I bringing this up, other than the general awesomeness of that story? It's because of the sound design. Ocarina of Time's sound design, I, I've been talking about this several times throughout the Zeldas. Honestly, in my opinion, this is the, some of, like, like, if you ever want to get into sound design in a game, I would point you to this game and say, look, analyze, study, dissect, just go through it and really pare down what they did and how they did it. Different sound effects for different types of structures, for different types of interactions, for different angles of interaction, constant uh, audible indicators of what's near you and what's around you, uh, variances based on, on, uh, on location. The, I, I, can't even, I can't even describe it. The, the overall sound design of this game is phenomenal. If you don't believe me, um, pull up like a a video, like a TAS or, or a playthrough where there's nobody talking of the game, and close your eyes and just listen to it. I guarantee you, especially if you've played the game before, you'll have a pretty good ch idea of where they're going, what they're doing. And I don't mean just generally. I mean, you could probably tell exactly where they are, because that's how a phenomenal the sound design is of this game. Um, let's see here. I think that's actually all the gameplay notes I have. I actually have quite a few notes here overall. Uh, one last note, Zelda uh, Ocarina of Time also basically was the origination of several races which have been major features ever since. These include the Kokiri, the Gorons, the Gerudo, the Hylians, 
Yes, the entire concept of Hylians or Hylians or Hylians, I've heard all of the above. Um, the Deku and the Shika, 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 again, whatever, uh, all basically started in this game. Furthermore, the Zora were actually made into a race. For many, many years, people were curious why these things were called the Zora. For those of you not aware, the Zora have actually been all the way back in Zelda 1 and have been an enemy ever since. Uh, they have since decided to basically make there be two species of Zora. The River Zora, which are the ones who fling stuff at you, and the Zora, which are these guys. Now, I think that's all I've got uh, for that. Let's go ahead and start going down story stuff, shall we? I'm going to try and do this as in order as I can, but there's going to be a lot of all over the place here because there's some interesting uh, concept here. So, first of all, the Deku Tree. I have several thoughts about the Deku Tree. One of the theories I've heard several, several times is, you remember the Minish, who basically have only been in the one game ever and never actually come back since? I've heard a very strong theory that the Minish are actually the Kokiri, that the Minish have mutated, warped, been changed by magic, however you want to think of it, over the however many years it's been since Minish Cap up into Ocarina of Time, to be these creatures that are limited to the forest but are still magical in nature and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I also have thoughts regarding the fairies about that, but I'll get to that in a second. Uh, the Deku Tree itself also has a very, uh, you know, f the Deku Tree's purpose there is to, in, to defend this area, keep it completely walled off from the slowly encroaching darkness of the rest of the world, which I will get into that darkness later when I talk about the war. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot that be said about that, especially given the ending of the Minish Cap, and, uh, and Four Swords, for that matter, both of which tie into this general idea that the Minish uh, and, and needed some kind of creature to allow them to keep existing in this reality. Which brings me to my next point, the fairies. Now this is an interesting one. If you really pay attention, every, every Kokiri has a fairy, right? But then Link gets a fairy, so he's great! Yay! Um, there's a long-standing theory that the Kokiri are actually the... Uh... Oh, shoot. Hang on. I wrote down their name. <laughs> uh, the Koroks in Wind Waker. Now you might be like, well, why? Well, let me, let me explain what I mean by this a little bit. We know that the forest that they're in is magical in nature, and it affects people who go into it. We also have a pretty good idea that the people who go in there become Stalfos or Stal children, right? Why is it that the Kokiri are protected from that? Furthermore, why was Link protected from that? Well, if you think about it, Link wasn't protected from that, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Think about it like this. Any creature there that has a fairy, the fairy themselves is what generates that protection. Not their nature, not the Deku Tree. It's the fairy that grants the protection to that individual and prevents them from, from being affected by the woods. It is also entirely possible that fairy is what is elongating artificially the lives of the Kokiri, since we don't see them ever age, uh, ever. And... You know, and and there's uh, some significant hints that, with the absence of the curse, in that is present in the woods, therefore no longer needing the fairies, the creatures themselves, the actual Kokiri, would be able to evolve naturally into what they really are, which is basically wood spirits. Hence the Koroks in in Wind Waker. Um, at least if I'm remembering the same thing, some of these notes I wrote a while ago. Uh, so forgive me if I'm completely screwing this up. But the relevant part to link here. So remember, Link becomes a Stalfos. Twilight Princess, the gentleman who we talked to, who has now been 100% absolutely confirmed to be the hero of time from Ocarina of Time. A lot of us suspected that for a really long time anyway, so it's not like it was a big shock. But having that confirmed was nice because, well, of a lot of reasons I'll get to more in Twilight Princess. But why does he become a Stalfos? Because he lost his fairy. You see how that ties in there? Uh, given the fact that the Lost Woods remains the Cursed Wood, for all intents and purposes, as of Twilight Princess, and still has the magical difficulties and problems it has as of Twilight Princess, it is logical to assume that uh, our good friend Link, after returning from Majora's Mask, degenerated, degenerated into a Stalfos and then had to find other means to keep going in order to pass on his knowledge for the next hero that would need it. Fun thoughts, right? Also, uh, I have a note here. I don't know exactly what it means. It's called Gold Skultilla's What the Hell. 
I'm not sure exactly what I meant by that, but I'm going to assume it has to do with how incredibly horrifying they are and the fact that there's actually a curse that was put on people to turn them into half-humans, half-skultulas, which is just terrifying. Um, I don't know how, what to add to that other than bleh, but whatever, moving on. <laughs> moving on. Also, uh, I will say this. I think that that's one of those examples of pure gameplay, no story. Which is a thing that happens even in games that are heavy on story, like this one. Um, the fact that there's Skulltulas in the past and the present. The fact that it, that if you get Skulltulas in the past and go to the present, he's changed. But if you get him in the present go to the past, he's changed as well. The fact that it completely ignores the timeline or anything else whatsoever. Shrug. And I'm okay with that, by the way. Uh, I think this is a good time as any to bring up something. So before I got to this, when I was working on the other Zelda series... A gentleman linked me a video. I will not call out names of whose video I was watching, but it was someone doing a, a review of Ocarina of Time and why Ocarina of Time was terrible. Now, uh, boilerplate here. If you don't like Ocarina of Time, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I've said this before, I've said this again. This is, this is the world, this is reality, and here we have this thing called difference of opinion, and it's awesome. Really, it is. It's something I celebrate, something I enjoy. You know how many times someone comes in my chat and disagrees with me while I'm streaming? Or how many times I get YouTube comments of someone who disagrees with me? I think it's awesome. As long as it's well-reasoned, as long as it's coached in, you know, reasonable discussion, reasonable... Di it, there's a reason I call something, uh, uh, you know, legitimate grievance. I, I use that phrase because it means someone has actually said, well, I don't like this and here's why, dot, dot, dot. And I'm with that. The rest of the time I hear someone say, this is terrible, and that's the extent of all I hear. I don't hear a legitimate grievance. I don't hear an actual reason. There's no reasoning. It's just someone who disagrees or is trolling or likes to be contrary or whatever. There's plenty of reasonings for this. But my reason for bringing this up is this gentleman's big reason for disliking this game was a story focus. Now, I find this to be a very fascinating idea because there is literally no denying that the Zelda games have been getting more and more story focus as they've been going on, uh, with the possible exception of some of the Gaiden games. But even in that case, I mean, just about every Zelda game, even, including Four Swords, uh, the, the one I just did, had a strong focus on story. This is not what used to be. This arguably started with Link to the Past, really, which had uh, a decent amount of theme strength to it, you know, characterization. I, I talked about all that during the then and now. But if you go back to the original Zelda, what's the story of Zelda? What's the story of Zelda 2? All right, there's a princess, there's pieces you gotta get, go. Now, I will say this. The person who was disagreeing with this put out his reasonings like this. You don't need the game telling you you want to go up the hill to see what's up there. You want to go up the hill to see what's up there because you want to see what's up there. That's your motivation. You don't need a guard to say, oh, I wonder what's up that hill. Or could you go please go up that hill or whatever. You don't need the dialogue. You don't need the interaction. On the one hand, I actually get that perspective. I really do. But on the other hand, I cannot disagree with it more. For me, I don't want to have a sandbox. I don't want to have a bunch of random stuff that I could go explore without reason or purpose behind it. I want to go up that hill because when I go up there I will find the Gorons who are in trouble and I want to help them. I want to go up that hill because there's, there's this flame dragon in there that's eating people. I want to go up that hill because I want to save this person. I want to go up that hill because this person asks me to because dot dot dot, you know? In other words, this is going all the way back to something I've discussed many, many times player-generated content versus developer-generated content. And I am firmly in the developer-generated content thing. Uh, let me make an, an anecdote here. I don't mean like, for example, if you're playing Star Trek Online, there's lots of player-generated content, but by my defini definition, that is still developer-generated content. Now, I know you're, you're looking at me weird, but my point is player-generated content means you, this person right here, the person sitting at the computer or sitting at the controller or whatever. That's the person generating the content. You make up whatever. You do whatever. Eve Online. You know, great example of this. For me, all I see when I see those kind of situations is something empty. Something lacking. I want to immerse myself in a world. A fictional world. Some place that has characters. Some place that has motivations. Some place that has a setting and theme and plot and all those five aspects of story. That's just me. But I mention this because I have often said that Link to the Past is actually better than Ocarina of Time. 
which is funny because this same gentleman was postulating the same theory for a completely different reason, which I tie all the way up back in to go back to that agreement-disagreement thing. We both disagree violently about our crown of time, and yet I love Link to the Past just like he does. This is why there's nothing really wrong. This is one of the reasons why there's nothing really wrong about agreements or disagreements. We can both... Something my sister and I do all the time is we will take different paths to reach the same conclusion. She will think A and I will think B and we'll both arrive at C. It, it happens all the time. It's actually really funny sometimes because we'll get into arguments. I, I definitely put the quote unquote because we don't yell or anything like that. But you know, it's like, no, da, 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 da. And we're both arguing stupidly because we both agree at the end result. But the other reason I bring all of this up is there's a lot of story to Ocarina of Time, and that's one of the reasons I'm going to be talking about it so extensively. You notice I had almost nothing to say about the gameplay. I mean, there's some good dungeon design, and there's some great graphics and aesthetics, and there's a few things that help, you know, flesh out things. But ultimately, in my opinion, gameplay-wise, the gameplay of Ocarina of Time kind of took a back seat to the story. There is definitely uh, a heavier emphasis on combat than there has been in most uh, Zelda. This is a theory I've heard tossed around many times that Ocarina of Time and most of the 3D Zeldas are more focused on combat than the adventure side of things, the exploration, the puzzle solving, etc. And I actually agree with this. It is far more, you know, a difficulty of trying out to figure out how to defeat these enemies and how to outwit this boss than it is figuring out how to push the buttons and how to move the blocks and all that kind of a thing. However, there is still clearly a puzzle solving aspect to Ocarina of Time. And, well... Anybody who's seen me stream this game knows there's several instances where I tend to talk about how incredibly lost I would get at certain puzzles because I was just like, huh? But I'm getting off topic. But one other thing I will say, I've always been against story and gameplay segregation. You know, some people think I only care about story in the games, and that is completely not true. I talk about story in games all the time because there's more to talk about with that. You know, I, I already just discussed the gameplay. There's not much else to say about the gameplay of Ocarina, right? At least in my opinion. Except for one thing. The gameplay in Ocarina almost always serves the story. There is integration between the two. So much of the aesthetics, so much of the design, so much of the music, so much of the, the, the way the combat works, so much of the camera angles all serve to help further the story rather than being completely segregated. But with the Gold Skull Tula's thing basically being the only thing that is just there for gameplay and nothing else. So I like the integration of story and gameplay. I am not some kind of every game must be Shakespeare, especially since I actually don't like Shakespeare. So that would be terrible if every game was Shakespeare. But you get my point, right? I hope I've made my point. I sure hope so, because I've rambled on this way too long. Let's move on. So there's been a, there are tons and tons and tons of theories about Zelda in general. Uh, I'm going to be mentioning a few. I'm also going to be uh, discussing a few and tossing out a few of my own that I've never seen other people postulate on. But I want to talk about the interloper thing, okay? So, for those of you not aware, the interlopers are a race, sort of, that we still don't know exactly who they were. They are mentioned in Twilight Princess as the originators of the Twi'li, or the Twi'lai, however you want to say that. Uh, you know, uh, Zant's people, Midna's people, Midna's people, whatever. <laughs> um... Some people speculate that Ganondorf actually is a member of this people, and there's a few there's a few bits of evidence to support this. Uh, I will say that I actually don't agree with that. But one of the things I do find interesting is during the Deku Tree's uh, initial spiel, he mentions several things, and you feel like he's actually talking about the Gerudo, and and Ganondorf in particular, and he does actually mention Ganondorf in particular. But at the same time, some of the things he's talking about could also be uh, interpreted as talking about the interlopers, assuming you interpret the interlopers in a certain way. I'll be talking more about that in just a bit, but I wanted to mention that here, because uh, that's where it is in my notes. Um, it is also worth noting that Ocarina of Time was kind of originally intended to be an origination story of the Zelda series. This is the first Ganon, the first Ganondorf. Uh, in the series, timeline-wise, regardless of how many Ganondorfs there are from now on, and there are two, as I've already mentioned, um, although one of them is a reincarnation, so that's debatable. But anyways, point being, this is the this is the origination of that, and the origination of many other things, really. I mean, the Master Sword is a good example of this. And yet, that was all thrown out the window with Minish Cap, and it was all thrown out the window with, with Skyward as well. I'm not sure what I think about that, but I will say this. I feel, personally, for two reasons, that Skyward Sword diminishes the impact of this game. Okay, Both of them have to do with Ganondorf. Reason number one. 
I suppose I'll just talk about Ganondorf now, because I was going to save this for later, but I'm already talking about it. Ganondorf is, was, is eh, a fascinating character to me. For someone who has so relatively little character development, he at the same time has several nuances to his character, mostly through his various uh, perspectives we see on his character. Now this is straying a bit into Wind Waker and straying a bit into Twilight Princess, but Twilight Princess, Wind Waker, and Ocarina really give us an insight into Ganondorf, the character. See, there's a war that happened pretty much just before Ocarina of Time. Couldn't have been that long ago because Link's mother was alive during the war. Now that's at least one war that we're aware of. I'll talk more about the war much later. I have it notes on my second page. But we do know that it is entirely feasible that that war involved the Gerudo. Uh, it is referred to in some text as a civil war. So it's entirely possible it was primarily in Ternicene with regards to Hyrule. But it is also very, very likely that the, the Zora were involved in it, and the Gerudo were involved in it, and the Gorons were involved in it. And all of these races uh, were involved in this horrible, horrible bloodshed. I've seen two general interpretations of the Gerudo specifically involvement into it, because both the other two sides are pretty linear. Both the Zoras and the Gorons, you actually literally in gameplay unlock accessing their leaders by, by using the tune which is indicative of the King of Hyrule. It is very obvious that the King of Hyrule was an ally of the Gorons and the Zoras. That's probably why he won the Civil War in the end and beat whatever other factions were trying to take, take over the kingdom or whatever. Maybe he was the one trying to usurp the kingdom. We don't know. We don't know details. But the point is, he won, in my opinion, because he had those two backers. With me? Yet none of that applies to the Gerudo. Now, the Gerudo might have been the instigators of this war, attacking to begin with. I personally like the idea better that they were backing whatever faction was not the King of Hyrule, the other faction in the Civil War, trying to use that to get the hell out of their hellscape. And again, I'll talk more about this, the specific Gerudo significance to that later. The significance to Ganondorf is, is sufficient, though, because let's look at the character. We have a young man who is very driven. Now, I like this because... Well, let me just explain what I don't like. one of the reasons I don't like the demise thing right now. The demise thing suddenly gives Ganondorf fate. Now, I generally don't like fate. Maybe that's just because I'm tired of it after so many years of fiction. You know, 30 years of reading and watching and playing. I'm just kind of tired of the I was fated and destined to be wonderful thing. It's the Amazing Spider-Man thing all over again. The movies, not, not the comics. Um, you know, ah, you were destined, you were born, you were lifted for greatness. No, Ganondorf was that awesome because he wanted to be. Because he worked for it. Because he had the drive for it. The will for it. He wasn't just innately powerful. He didn't have demises, reincarnation within him or anything like that. He pushed for it. Now, it's also worth noting that the two elder crones, whose names I have no idea how to pronounce, Kote and Kaume, I want to say, um, are probably at least part of that. But we have a gentleman who, again, thanks to the age thing, was growing up and was probably involved in the war against the war in Hyrule, right? All of Ocarina centers around this war, by the way, so I'm going to be mentioning it several times. Um, this war... Imagine how the Gerudo live. Look at the look at the the Zora. They have this nice, wonderful, peaceful, beautific place to live. They have the lake all to themselves. They have the rivers all to themselves. Look at the Gorons. They've got all the ore they could need. They've got all the gemstones they could ever want. You know, it's wonderful, plentiful. Notice that both of these people are also punished by Ganondorf once he comes to power too. More fuel for the thought, thought that he was an antagonist in the war involved. That these two were fighting against him and the Gerudos in. Because what the Gerudos have is desert wasteland. Pay attention next time you go through there. And they're ignoring the obvious wastes of the desert thing, the the actual spirit temple out there looks like ruins, and, and older ruins than normal, which I'll, I'll talk more about why I think that is later. Um, and, and the actual fortress they've got looks like it was just thrown together with what resources they have. And you just gotta imagine that kind of a life has just gotta be a struggle to continue on, right? Ganondorf himself basically confirms this in Wind Waker. You know, I coveted that wind, that whole thing. So the idea here is there's a man who is desperate. I know this is all interpretation, but hear me out. A man who is desperate to better his people, his land, his own standing as well, don't mistake. But I think Ganondorf didn't start out as a villain. At least before you add demise to the picture. I think he was just a man who pushed and who became magically powerful, and who became as strong as he is, and as dedicated as he is, through skill and will and determination, rather than 
because Demise happened to have done this thing. You see why I dislike the Demise thing? I feel like it just cheapens his character. So this man, Ganondorf, charges forward, and he he goes to war with Hyrule, and he freaking fails. He loses. The king of Hyrule is established as the new monarch. The Civil War ends. A few years pass. Gerudo become a vassal state of the Hyrule Kingdom. Ganondorf himself literally bowing to the king. All of that happens. Ganondorf plans revenge. He needs more power. He needs something that can actually push against the kind of threat, against the kind of martial might that Hyrule has. And he learns of the Triforce. And all the pieces just kind of fall into place then, don't they? This is why I like this rather than the Fate thing. It's also one of the reasons why the Wind Waker Link is my favorite Link. Because he wasn't fated to do Jack. He wasn't destined. He wasn't descendant of the hero. There's no blood of the Knights of Hyrule in him. He's a kid who did it because he pushed himself to do it. Through his will, through his determination, through his strength of character, he kept going and he actually accomplished it. And I like that. And that's what I liked about Ganondorf until Demise showed up and completely ruined that. One other thing, though. It is still possible to include Demise without ruining Ganondorf's character, at least not completely. And that is by simply saying that Demise's power is what, it was, is what was reincarnated into Ganondorf, and therefore it gave him the extra oomph to, to do all the things that he did. Now you might be like, well, what about Ganondorf being evil? Have you not been paying attention? Is it not incredibly easy for a man in his condition to descend into darkness for all intents and purposes, to become an evil person because of all he went through and all he failed at? This also perfectly explains his character development in Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, by the way, but I want to save those discussions for those games. Suffice it to say, Ganondorf is a very, very interesting character here, and I really like what they did with him. Uh, do I have any other notes about him? I do somewhere. Where is it? Where is it? Uh... Aha! One other thing that I find interesting about Ganondorf is he has... He constantly underestimates Link. If, my, if, if we remove Demise from the picture and my speculation, my interpretation of Ganondorf is correct, this is wonderful irony. Literal irony, by the way. Dramatic irony. Because... Or not dramatic irony. Uh, whatever. One of the forms of irony. Because Ganondorf himself was a nobody who rose to power and strength through his own will, determination, etc., and yet, even by the end of the game, Ganondorf constantly d looks down his nose, basically, at Link. Even one of his final lines is, I underestimated you, Link. No, I actually underestimated the Triforce of Courage. Refusing to give respect or acknowledgement to Link's accomplishments, and insisting it was the Triforce all along, even though Link accomplished great things as a child before he ever got the Triforce of Courage. So, I, I, I find that wonderfully ironic, and of course, leading to his downfall, therefore... Uh, completing the circle there. <sighs> okay, so let's stop talking about Ganondorf. Um, let's talk about the Light Force. So there's a lot of theories about the Light Force and if it has anything to do with anything. Uh, it is worth noting that, as I've talked about before, the Light Force and the Force Gems and all that were originally supposed to be the same thing, and that was supposed to be originally directly tied into the Triforce. Um, obviously that has all been tossed out the window in official canon, even though it makes perfect sense and there's no real reason to do so. Regardless, there is no denying that based on what we see in basically every Zelda, the actual character, from this point on, timeline-wise, that the Light Force still has that power, is still being carried forward through the blo uh, bloodlines, just like it was in Minish Cap, just like it is here, with several of the actions uh, Zelda is able to accomplish. It also is very likely, I think, that the Sheikah, which is how I usually pronounce it, uh, were probably an organization generated and built around the concept of that light force as an elite force to keep guard of it, regardless of nationalities, regardless of loyalty to kings or rulers or whatever, just following the bloodline and keeping that power safe and secured uh, throughout the ages. Just my opinion on that. Uh, the... Well, let's, hang on. I've got so many notes here. Um... The Gorons, okay. First of all, I love the Gorons. They were kind of an out-of-nowhere invention for this game. Uh, there wasn't really anything even like the Gorons prior to this. The rock people who eat gemstones and whatnot. I just love that idea. I love that concept. I love its execution. They're a very fun race. They're like... 
they're like Klingons if the Klingons were happy rather than angry all the time, you know? They're the, they're the warrior, honor-bound race. Except they're, ah, yeah, let's give a hug, brother. I like the Gorons a lot. I thought their inclusion was a great move. Um, I also uh, think Darunya is freaking amazing. I also find it interesting that the Gorons have such a strong sense of loyalty. I find myself wondering what exactly the King of Hyrule did to uh, to convince them to join his side. He specifically refers to the king as his brother, uh, Bond brother. So, um, what does this say? God, I can barely read my own handwriting. Ah! Uh, of course, as we know, the Gorons have been around since Skyward. In fact, they've been ground dwellers since Skyward. So it's entirely possible they have been integrally tied into the development of the Kingdom of Hyrule and the various iterations thereof ever since. Um, Jabu Jabu. Jabu Jabu is interesting. If you notice, and I made a couple lists here. Let's see, we've got the Windfish from Link's Awakening. We've got Chapu Chapu. I believe that's in Majora's. We've got the Ocean King. That's in Phantom Hourglass. Uh... And Jaboon, which I'll talk about in just a moment. A lot of creatures seem to have that similarity of the water, semi-deific, semi-mythical creature thing going on uh, in the Zelda series. I and it, How literal you want to take these creatures kind of depends on you. I will say this personally. Uh, some people speculate that Jabu Jabu is the wind fish and that, you know, these creatures are all just the same creature representing itself differently. I don't think that's actually true. Personally, it's my perspective that this is actually a species that we just don't see that much of. Similar to the Zora, similar to the Goron, similar to the Kokiri, similar to the uh, Gerudo, just much, much less represented. And we see them only periodically because they are such influencers on the setting because of their relative power, because of the natural, mythical, and magical nature of these creatures. From a writing perspective, you don't want to have a whole race of them unless you're really ramping up the threat level to 11, right? Make sense? Uh, that's just my take on it, personally. Uh, I mentioned I'd talk about Jabu. There was a deleted scene, which I don't know if it's good or not, that Jabu Jabu was actually supposed to be dead in the present. And there was a younger version, which was going to be growing up similar to the young Kokiri. Or the young Deku Tree, excuse me. Uh, which uh, then makes its appearance in Wind Waker. But, and then that creature was also going to, that windfish, or not windfish, that, uh, the young Jabu Jabu was actually going to make an appearance in Wind Waker as well, which obviously also fell through. Just some thoughts. I will say this. Of the various creature curses that are put into the things, Baronade is just terrifying. I mean, can you imagine having that thing inside you? Uh, this is probably a good time to talk about the cultural significance of the thro of the stones. So, I like the fact that there is cultural significance behind this, behind two of the stones. The fact that that emerald, uh, excuse me, sapphire, is something that's been passed down through generation to generation as literally a stone of lineage. I give this to you to signify that we're becoming, you know, that we are being bonded together, that kind of a thing. Uh, it shows how important that stone has always been to the Zora people. Similarly, the Gorons treat the ruby with basically the exact same level of reverence. Uh, ironically, the Kokiri don't really have a society in that sense of the word, not in that scale. But at the same time, there is a clear reverence for the Emerald, especially in the Deku Tree himself, which, which makes sense, again, given uh, the significance it has overall. Question, though, where did these stones come from? I've postulated this many times, and after looking into it quite a bit, near as I can tell, we'll never know the truth. There is no hard, concrete evidence on where these gemstones actually came from and why they were used to seal away the, uh, the Master Sword. The best theory I can come up with personally is that these three stones were literally used to seal Fee away all the way back when Fee first became the Master Sword, you know, pretty much at the end of Skyward Sword, and then they have been passed down from generation to generation ever since, hence their significance. Since, remember, they're, they're just there to seal away the Master Sword. They don't guard the entrance to the Sacred Realm, per se. They don't guard the uh, the, the time-traveling thing. That's separate. It's all about guarding the Master Sword. Unless... <laughs> unless something happened that enabled Fee to become a literal conduit to the Sacred Realm, which is entirely possible given her nature and the fact that she was literally constructed by uh, Hylia, or Hylia, however you say her name, and... Uh, so it is entirely possible that the Master Sword has always been the gateway. Fee has always been the gateway to the Sacred Realm. Which actually is kind of backed up by one tiny little thing in Skyward Sword. There's been a lot of speculation in Skyward Sword that the Spirit Realm you enter, I forget what they call it, 
uh, you know, when everything goes kind of gray and there's horrible spirits around and it's terrifying, uh, that that is actually the sacred realm, which actually would make sense. Because remember, the sacred realm we know is the dark world in Link to the Past, or what rather was changed in the dark world. We also know that the dark world and the sacred realm, or excuse me, that the normal realm are basically one to one. They're just parallels of each other. So the idea that you go into this new realm in Skyward Sword and it just looks different and has different creatures and it actually makes a lot of sense, you know, being the parallel side by side thing. Also, in Skyward Sword, when you get the Triforce pieces, it gets this golden hue, just like the Sacred Realm does. So it is actually entirely feasible that Fee was always the gateway guardian to that, and the removal of her from the pedestal is what allowed entrance into the Sacred Realm for Ganondorf, as we already saw, and for Link, uh, fortunately or otherwise. <sighs> um, if that's true, I find myself wondering if uh, it was deliberate or not, basically, if the gemstones were there to seal the gateway, to seal her, or both. This is, this is all mostly speculation, uh, with only a few bits of fact to toss in there. That's how most Zelda games go. Uh, that's one of the reasons why there's such a strong theorycrafting community around Zelda. We know very few actual facts. I mean, God, it was only within recent years we actually found out the frickin' timeline, the official timeline of the Zelda series. That's recent, remember, but I'm getting off track. Um, so the, I mentioned the stones, uh, one other thing I want to mention with regards to those, uh, is nothing, hang on, that's not what I wanted to talk about, <laughs> did I already talk about, yes, Rauru, now it has been since long, it's been long since confirmed that Rauru and Heipora Gebora are the same entity, I find that very fascinating for a couple of reasons, first of all, why an owl? Why does he appear as an owl? Why does he, the only sage, well, that's a lie, one of two sages who shows the ability to change their appearance in a magical manner, in his case into an owl, and in Zelda's case into Sheik. Why does that ability just exist all of a sudden? Well, again, it is possible it's just a power of the sages and the others didn't use it, but I think it has to do with the Sacred Realm's nature of changing you into your true form. Remember all the way back in Link to the Past where they did that? And you took a different form while there? Uh, this actually could be ironic, as it could be an explanation of why Link became, you know, the adult, but I don't think that's true personally. But my point is, it's entirely possible that the Sage of Light, Rauru, Rauru, whatever, um, is actually an owl. That is his true form, and he appears as the old man in the Sacred Realm. Or, and I like this theory better, the reverse is true. In other words, Rauru has always been a denizen of the Sacred Realm. He's been one of the only denizens of the Sacred Realm for however many years and years and years. Remember, he never leaves it unless he's an owl. And it rever works in reverse. You know, in other words, it's not just if you go to the light world and then you switch worlds, you change shape. It goes this way, too. So he is a poor person in the light, in the, in the light world, in the Sacred Realm. And when he leaves, he takes a shape sim similar to his personality, hence becoming an owl. This would also explain one of the reasons why the other two people who go in there, Ganondorf and Link, don't actually change appearance when they do so. Link because he's protected, Ganondorf because, well, he actually probably did change shape uh, and then just took the power and then left, but eh, we never see that, so it doesn't matter. <sighs> A couple interesting thoughts here. First of all, Rauru's motives are suspect, I think. There are two possibilities for why Link stays in stasis for seven years. Possibility number, well, three, really. Possibility number one, the sword did it. Don't buy that for a second, but it is possible. O option two, the realm did it. Again, possible, and it could be that interpretation, you know, you change to reflect your thing, so he, he would already grown up so much, and already had manned up so much. Remember, this is before he had the Triforce of Courage, so he had already become this embodiment of heroism, he just needed to actually have the body to back it up, so the Sacred Realm was like, okay, we'll just put you on hold for seven years. Third possibility, Rauru did it. Now, why? Well, there's a bunch of reasons why he could have done that. Let's, let's discuss a couple other facts about him, first of all. We know he was in there during the war, the Civil War. We don't know for certain, but it is possible the Civil War also involved fighting over the Triforce. There are a couple other references to old wars in games that happen after this one, timeline-wise, of wars that were fought specifically over, over the Triforce. The Interloper War, which is mentioned in Twilight Princess, and the... the uh, I forget what it's actually called, but the war in, that is mentioned in Link to the Past, which also was being fought over the Triforce. 
Both of these could very easily have been this same war. Personally, I do think it was the same war. This one massive conflict between all these forces in the area, between all the major factions in the area, not just for control over the kingdom, but for access to the Triforce. This would also be one, uh, an excellent explanation of why those three gemstones exist in order to protect uh, in order to protect the gateway to the Sacred Realm, because that would have been established after the war. In other words, by this interpretation, it's recent, not old. Those gemstones are recently being used for this purpose. Now, I mean, the gemstones might have existed before, but they have been deliberately enchanted and enhanced to be locks on this gateway into the Sacred Realm as a sign of the treaty, as a sign of the peace, and as a way to ensure that no one else could ever fight over the Triforce anymore. Hence why they take one gemstone from the, the Zoras, allies of Hyrule, one gemstone from the Gorons, allies of Hyrule, and one gemstone from the Kokiri, which, while not actually allies, there's a strong implication that, the, that it was basically kind of a safe haven location for uh, during the war. You see, the, you see how this ties in here? Now you might be like, well, okay, what about the Raru thing? Um, wait, what? Oh, right, right. Um, I mentioned this because Raru was absolutely in the Sacred Realm during the war, and yet near as we can tell did nothing to interfere with it. This ties into another theory that... Has... <sighs> so... I've had a theory... I shouldn't even say call it a theory. I, I guess I could. Once upon a time, I automatically assumed... All the sages were dead, as of the present timeline, as of the when you're the you know the adult, right? Um, it was just it was just so obvious to me. It wasn't until I started mentioning it to my viewers uh, some time ago, a couple of years ago now, when I was streaming Okarana, that they were like, "Well, no, they're not dead." And I'm like, "Huh?" And it, it never it literally never occurred to me that the sages might not be dead. It seemed so thematically appropriate to me, and it just kind of fit in my head. You know, it, it fit. Now, when I actually analyze it, there's very, very, very little card evidence that the sages are dead. Ironically, there's also very, very little evidence that sages are alive. Because each of the sages, the way they interact with you outside of the sacred realm is either limited or gets terminated artificially in some way. So, yeah. Um... A good example of this is how Ruto is the one who warns you about Morpheal despite not being in the room. Kind of just a voice from the air kind of a thing. Uh, or uh, Noburu, the, the Garuda woman, who gets zapped and then just vanishes until you see her in the Sacred Realm. Indicating that she may have actually been killed in that action. And of course, Darunia goes into the place to fight Volvagia. And then when you go in to fight Volvagia, Darunia is nowhere to be seen. And then you see him in the sacred realm, and you get my idea. So the point here being that there's not really evidence. There's just speculation. But this is relevant because it's entirely possible that the sages, being partially spiritual beings, can exist in the sacred realm even if their bodies have been destroyed, even if they are dead for all intents and purposes. If this is true, Raru, Rauru, God, might actually have died during the Civil War. He might not have stayed out of it. He might not actually have been involved in it. He might have been killed during the, those actions and therefore stranded for all intents and purposes in, in, the, uh, in the sacred realm, only able to manifest in the form of an owl outside in the world proper. I do find it interesting how he had his eyes on Link basically from the beginning, though. Um, especially since, again, no Triforce at that point in time. Although he did have the Emerald, so that might have been what got, caught his attention. Um... The other, uh, the other thing I want to mention, uh, you, you know, I mentioned his motives and the speculation of why he would have kept Lynx sealed all that time. It is, I don't, I'm not saying he's evil, let's make this clear. But what I mean by this is he comes across as much more manipulative if you consider that Link entered and, you know, has the Master Sword and is ready to go fight Ganondorf and Raru says, no, 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 no. You're not ready yet. Whether Link was ready or not, we will never know. Like, we, we literally will never actually learn the truth of that because Rauru, or the sword, or the sacred realm, froze him in time for seven years until he had a stronger body to use and said, okay, now go. And yet it was always all about the body because he already had the mind, he already had the determination, he already had the courage in order to do his job. So he literally just wanted him to have the stronger body. My point is, was he right or not? We don't know. But Rauru 
was very calculating and very cold in this decision, if he is indeed the one who made it. Because he was willing to let all the horrible things that happened over the past seven years, and however many people died, and however many people suffered, happen, just so that they would have, better, have a better chance of success. And if he is someone who actually died during a war to accomplish trying to find the Triforce and claim power over the region, he's the kind of person who would have first-hand experience of why you need to be ready for that kind of action rather than just charging off headstrong. So I'm not saying he's evil, again. Just puts an interesting light on his character. Um, where's my notes? Hang on. I suppose we'll talk about the temples. Now, each of the temples uh, in the... Okay, let's actually rewind a moment. I like the thematic approach. It's all about the graphics and the audio, you know, the, the, the sound effects, the music, and the general approach and just intangible feel. The first three dungeons feel like adventures. I mean, really, it, it, let's just... It feels like you're reading a children's book, almost. And then he charged into the giant tree and defeated the evil spider, and he, he walked into the heart of a, of a volcano and, 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 and took down the, the massive beast, and then he went into the, the mouth of a giant whale and, and saved it from within. You know, it sounds like an adventure. It sounds like something a kid would do or a kid would make up, you know, to playing pretend. The adult dungeons feel much darker, much more serious and much more real. Just in terms of the music, in terms of the approach, like I said, that intangible feeling. I, I've really had this, uh, I've had this before, but I really had this feeling on this replay. Going through the forest temple, going through, uh, going through the, the shadow temple, for God's sakes, going through the fire temple, all of them just felt like now it has become real. We are no longer on an adventure. Now this has become a serious threat. This is an actual, you know, the stakes have been risen. We are doing this, and there's no necessarily good answer. It's not just, ha, it's more like, you know, grim resignation to this thing rather than jubilant uh, exultation. Does that make any sense? Um, it is also interesting to me because each of the temples, in my opinion, had some kind of usage and purpose before being used as a temple. In other words, they weren't just temples, which I'll get a little bit more to this in just a second. Um, the Some of the temples are pretty obvious. Uh, for example, the Shadow Temple... Oh god, the Shadow Temple uh, was obviously a dumping ground, for lack of a better way to put it, uh, which I'll talk about in just a moment. I don't want to get in, out of order. The Spirit Temple, I have my own theories of, uh, but I want to talk about the Forest Temple first, because that's where we're starting. I think the Forest Temple was a prison. A nice prison with a barracks taking over it, but a prison nonetheless. Everything about it just screams that to me. The, the, pre the strong presence of the pose and general ghastly creatures here, the overall approach to the design of it and the courtyard and whatnot, the, um, the, the, the more archaic architecture, which is much more military-lined than of the other places. It just feels like the kind of place that they would have used to imprison people, and I really don't want to get too much into raw speculation here, but... If you're the kind of nation that's imprisoning people in a forest you know is cursed. Ugh. You notice how many Stalfos are in that place, too? Of course, it could be the reverse, too. It could have been a prison or a manor or something like that that became cursed and therefore is the source of the cursed in the woods in general. Uh, we don't actually know. Both of these are entirely feasible. Uh, the water temple, in my opinion, is really obvious. It's a place to purify the water and ensure that they, the, uh, the, the water from the lake uh, that is also going through the river is, is pure and clean and therefore has no issues. The, lo the, the fire temple is a place to make sure that, that Death Mountain, the volcano, doesn't erupt, etc., etc. Um, I will also say that uh, Phantom Ganon, I have a theory about Phantom Ganon, um, I know that Phantom Ganon's kind of been a thing from this point on, but he's always been a little different than this one Phantom Ganon. This one Phantom Ganon doesn't feel like Phantom Ganon, if that makes any sense. He feels like a Poe. He feels like... And in this dungeon that has all the undead, has all the Poe sisters and, and the various uh, spectral essences to it, it makes a lot of sense that you'd be fighting what is effectively a large Poe, given form, right at the end there. Um, also makes me wonder if this is kind of an amalgam... Po, that several different Poes have been have con combined together to create this creature, and then Ganondorf just banishes it because he's a dick. But anyways, um, I mentioned that already. 
the I don't actually have that many thoughts about the water temple or the fire temple, other than what I've already mentioned. Um, I actually didn't forget a, a key this time to the water temple. Yay! <laughs> uh, I do love the design of the fire temple. The fact that it's basically just one large tower is brilliant. The fact that you can actually fall pretty much all the way down from the top to the bottom is brilliant, if horrifying. Some great design there. Um, I, um, I guess this is a good time to mention my next thing. Uh, then I want to really talk about the Shadow Temple and the Spirit Temple. And maybe I'll wait. I'll wait a wait. So we'll talk more about the temples in a little bit. Uh, first, I want to talk about a scene that was a deleted scene. Uh, Ingo. Injo? Mm. Uh, actually originally burnt the ranch to the ground. The, the ranch where you get Epona. And Malin and Talon uh, actually moved on and tried to make their lives anew after he burnt it down in revenge. They decided to get rid of that. Uh, I'm not 100% sure why. Mm. Um, speaking of things that has been re retconned and, and debated for many, many years, uh, the presence of the Redeads in Hyrule Town. The, the strongest standing theory for a long time was that those were some of the denizens of Hyrule Town that are still there. Several of Nintendo the Nintendo the Nintendo developers came in and said, No, 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 those weren't people. Redeads were never people. They are monsters, and therefore they cannot be the people they moved in afterwards. Feel free to assume whichever one you actually enjoy more. Um Yeah. Uh Each song, this is actually really nice, each song you learn from Sheik uh, shows a side of moving on with life, different aspects of growing up. Now, I've, it's funny because, you know, you literally grow up in Ocarina of Time physically and emotionally, and yet I actually feel that's one of the major themes of Majora's Mask, which we'll, of course, get to next week. Um, hopefully... But uh, I find it interesting because the entire point is it's not about Link with the way she keeps teaching these songs to you in the dialogue. It's far more about her. Her decision to grow up. Her culmination. Everything that she's been going through through seven years. Remember, she didn't just get warped to the future. She had to deal with seven years of, of, of oppression and violence and God knows what else. She had to just live through that mess. She doesn't get those seven years back. Now, uh... I guess we're up to that point. Let's go ahead and talk about the Shadow Temple. Now, first of all, the symbolism of the dungeon under the well is brilliant in its obvious subtlety. There is this dark, disgusting place with hidden horrors and death and bones and crap um, in a well, which people draw their, their drinking water from, which is gross to begin with. But more importantly... It's just under the surface. I've always felt that Ocarina of Time is a very dark game. Uh, some of my viewers disagree with me on this. Uh, but I feel that the reason, for, that the, the approach to it is all that darkness is just under the surface. Literally. Like, like in, in addition to figuratively. The idea that the, there's no, nothing obviously dark about Ocarina of Time. There's nothing obviously horrible about it. It's just lurking right under there. And again, this gets into the implications of the war, which really comes forward in, in the next two temples, the Shadow Temple and the Spirit Temple. First we have the Shadow Temple, which, and I wrote this down, quote, quote here, Hyrule's bloody history of greed and hatred. Now, I already talked about the war in general, but I want to talk about the Shadow Temple's uh, involvement in that war. Because there's a lot of theory crafting that can go on with that. First of all, a couple factoids. Uh, Bongo Bongo, uh, the, the the boss of this place, uh, has pretty clearly been decapitated and or had its hands chopped off, um, which is pretty horrible. There's a, I've I've seen dozens of theories of what Bongo Bongo actually is. I'll be giving my own in just a second. The other thing I want to talk out toss out here though is that the barge of the dead, which we actually can travel on in the Shadow Temple to get further into the temple, uh, is activated by the song of Hyrule. You know, uh, Zelda's melody, the the theme that is indicative of the Hyrulean people, the one that you use to access the Gorons, and they think it's a messenger from the king. The one that you use to access the Zora, because representative of the king. I mention this because, in my opinion, there is absolutely no denying that the king of Hyrule and the current Hyrulean government 
made the Shadow Temple, like I said, as a dumping ground. Get rid of all of the dead, and there are hundreds of dead from that terrible, bloody war, and just kind of dump them off here. So then, what is Bongo Bongo? God, that's a dumb-sounding name. Well, a lot of people have, have speculated that, you know, there's he's a musician, or that he was a thief, or that he was a traitor, and there's plenty of other, of other theories. Personally, I think Bongo Bongo is quite literally an amalgam creature, effectively a big po, like we see in other games. Um, something that is comprised of all of the dead who died during the war. I think the drum isn't just music, and the chanting, the singing he does, I don't think that's just musical. I think that's war drums. I think that's the, 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 the battle chants of war. I think this is literally the manifested cost in terms of death, in terms of suffering, of the war being given form and being let out and, and, and causing all the horrors uh, that it could and would in the future, and nearly destroying Link when Link tried to defend Sheik uh, in Kakariko. It is also worth noting that Bongo Bongo was specifically sealed in the well, not the Shadow Temple, and yet, immediately after breaking out of the well, it went into the Shadow Temple. Which furthers my point. The place where all of its fellow brethren, where its own composite bodies are buried. There's... Uh, it is entirely possible, too, that they didn't just bury their own people here, that the enemies, you know, the, the losing side in the war was also buried in the Shadow Temple, which would add to the generally malefic uh, atmosphere and feeling that the place has. Also, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the obvious symbolism of the fact that in order to actually see a lot of the Shadow Temple, you need the lens of truth. Once again, hearkening back to that hidden truth, you know, this is, this is the thing that they want to hide. This is the aspect of Hyrule they don't want to think about. They just want to lock it away and never go back to it again. And you need the lens of truth to see it. You see the symbolism there. Spirit Temple. So I've heard a lot of theories about the Spirit Temple. I'm just going to go ahead and toss mine out here, and you're all going to make fun of me for it. I think it's where the Gerudo used to live. I think before the war even began, the Gerudo overall lived in that temple, and life was hard. I mentioned this uh, now a couple points in my favor. The, the ruins of that place, in my opinion, would indicate one of two things. Either A, it was under attack during the war, causing it to go into such disrepair, or B, it was into ruins and, and was degenerating long before the war actually started, which is what I actually think is the truth. And that was the, like I said, that was the home, the, the capital, if you will, of the Gerudo people uh, prior to the war. And because that was where Ganondorf was born, and life was so harsh and so horrible, this is why he then led his people in, into the conflict, right? You with me? Um, the uh, other thing I want to mention about the Spirit Temple, excuse me, is that the two... Uh, Ocarina does this on occasion. Like I said, very dark game in my opinion. Uh, and as I speculated earlier, I personally think that the two, the twin witches, actually kill Noburo on camera, actually. Uh, obviously, that is not necessarily true, but it, it is what I speculate. But at the same time, the next thing that happens is they both die and then go up to heaven in this incredibly hilarious scene as they're bickering back and forth between each other. It's, it's a very rare game that can pull off that kind of a dichotomy, I guess, for lack of a better term. Juxtaposition, that's the word I want. That kind of juxtaposition. Um, let's talk about the final thing I have to talk about. Final two things here. I'm, I'm wrapping up, I swear. First of all, Ganon's Tower. Now, originally, I, I've always thought that Ganon's Tower was just there for gameplay. There's no lore explanation for it at all. But then I replayed it with analysis mode on, and I was like, well, hang on a second. This feels like a perfect setup situation because, first of all, Ganon's just Ganondorf is just hanging out there at the top, waiting for Link to find him. Or, to put this phrase more accurately, Ganondorf is just up there waiting for the person with the Triforce of Courage to find him. It's chilling, waiting for it. Second of all, he deliberately has these trials. They're actually called the trials of, of Ganondorf uh, for people to get through there. And well, I'll just go ahead and get straight to my theory. We go into each of these temples to awaken various people as sages. 
um, to to basically bring out within them their potential to be a partially spiritual creature, to, to put it more mundanely. And then each of those people exist within the spirit realm up from that point on, at least up until they, they portal out uh, to watch the ending. As I've said, I already theorized that they are either dead or mostly dead, depending on how you define dead, um, you know, physically dead, in, 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 prior to or during the events of the event. I've already given my, my uh, evidence, such as it is for that. Regardless of that, though, I think that awakening them wasn't enough. I think that they needed to then have the energy of each of those temples be released and freed because Ganondorf had been channeling that energy in order to, to, to create his barrier, to create uh, a, a defense so that only someone who was sufficiently courageous could actually defeat his trials, release all those seals, and get in there. It's kind of a self-defeating thing, actually. I'm making this barrier so it can be defeated kind of a situation. But that's actually my lore explanation for why... Uh, Ganondorf had that situation, why there were the seals in there, why each one releases one of the sages who then enables, uh, enables you to go forth and actually enter Ganon's tower proper. Final thoughts, of course. The Ganondorf fight is, this is actually the first game that we have the, uh, oh, I forget what they actually call it, but the, 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 the volley minigame, you know, the back and forth thing that has since become iconic to a lot of the Ganondorf fights. Um, there's a few ways to cheap it out, I won't talk about those. I will say that they do a good job of trying to emphasize that Ganondorf is raw powerful, but not very skilled at this point in time. And then a scene happens, which is still one of my favorite scenes in gaming history. You, you run down the tower and everything's collapsed and everything explodes. Looks great on the 3DS version, by the way. And then you're there talking and then Ganondorf emerges from it, hovers there, gasping, panting, still wounded, br brutalized, beaten, but not actually killed because he's just that powerful and that determined he has that will driving him and he pulls up the triforce of power and stops caring one of the things i actually like about the one-winged angel concept in fiction is the entire idea at least for me has always been when you go into one-winged angel form you've given up you no longer care about your plans you no longer care about winning you no longer care about your long-term thing when you finally descend to that point where you're willing to d destroy effectively your body in order to become this one-winged angel form it's not your true form per se it is the form you have degenerated into because all you care at this point is killing that guy the hero or the heroes or the heroines or whatever you only care about defeating them you have been beaten and broken and brutalized and your plans have failed and damn it, I'm going to bring you down with me. And that is exactly the feeling I get from that thing. Ganondorf has lost and all he cares about now is getting his revenge on the man who destroyed him. The one child, the speck, who he didn't have respect for. Remember, the whole time he was, he was he had zero caring, zero uh, acknowledgement or, or, uh, or, or respect for... for for Link, and to be defeated by such a speck has to be got so insulting and so infuriating that he just says, screw it, and unleashes the full power of the Triforce of Power in him and gets turned into this monstrous creature. And as the thunder rumbles in the background and the lightning clashes and you see him just pull out these massive, I don't even know what to call them, these massive spine sword axe things and scream in rage, incapable of even speaking at this point, you really get a sense for that. And, of course, this is also, canonically, the very first appearance of Ganon. Also, nice touch. Throughout the entire game, including and up to the Ganondorf fight, there's this little subtitle. You know, the, the, the aquatic eel or whatever, and then the, uh, uh, the, the, the armored spider, and the... And I forget all of them, but, you know, the king of evil. You know, There's always a t subtitle. When Ganon shows up, it's just Ganon which is a great story and gameplay integration, by the way, thing, because it just indicates the severity of what this is. There's no title. The game, it's like the game is telling you it can't even make anything of what it is. It's just Ganon. Simple, blunt, pure. And again, the first introduction of Ganon into the series. And it's funny because you look back at the old Zeldas, and this is the first moment I really felt like Ganon was this monstrous, horrible thing, and I was just blown away by it. It was awesome. Um, believe it or not, that's basically all I have to talk about. Um, I will say this, uh, obviously Navi leaves during the ending, and then there's the time thing. Right, I guess I do have one more thing to talk about. 
the timelines of Zelda don't actually make sense because they are not co coherent with themselves. I don't even remember if I brought this up before because it's been a bit since I recorded the last few videos. Um, but the t as you can see, but the timelines of Zelda don't make up, don't line up. Okay, I'm gonna try and explain why as best as I can. I always have trouble explaining time travel, even though it makes perfect sense to me and always has. I don't know why. Temporal mechanics have always been very easy for me. You can't have multiple forms of time travel within a setting. If you're going to have a way that time travel works, you have to remain consistent with it. If you get inconsistent with it, if you break the rules, basically, then that's a plot hole. It's bad writing. The, the end. It's like, and if you don't understand what I mean, it's like saying gravity works this way all the time, except for every now and again when you need it not to. That's inconsistency, right? It's, it's bad writing, and, and, and there are probably ways to argue around this, but I'm going to stand firm on this point. So if you're having time travel, you need to lay out exactly how it works and make it make consistency. This is why the third timeline thing has always been bullcrap, by the way, and why nobody guessed it, including me, until the uh, Historia came out and, and, and highlighted the third timeline. Because it's like this. Up until the end of Ocarina of Time, it's all one timeline. There is no split time path. Serious. I'm serious. There is no altered timeline. It is all the exact same events up until the end of Ocarina of Time. At the end, that's when, rather than you taking the sword and being reverted back to the past of the same timeline, that is the exact moment at which Zelda uses the Ocarina and sends you back in a different method before the game even began. You with me? That action created the second timeline, okay? Up until then, the time travel has actually been fairly self-consistent. Including then, the time travel is fairly self-consistent. Because she did that, she gave you your life back. We'll talk more about that in Majora's Mask. Um, she gives you your life back, basically at the expense of hers, and also makes what is effectively an incredibly stupid decision, for all intents and purposes. Then that link goes, warns Zelda of Ganondorf, and that leads into the Twilight Princess timeline. Completely different branch. But all the events we saw still go forward. Everything we saw in Ocarina of Time is effectively the Wind Waker timeline. Except for that one cutscene at the end where Link goes to meet Zelda. That's the only thing that's in the other timeline, in the Twilight Princess timeline. You with me? So all of this makes co complete coherent sense. And then they add the third timeline, which makes no sense at all. And completely throws all those rules out the window because, oh, and by the way, there's also a timeline which we never see and never know anything about where Link just dies at some point in time, somewhere along the line. Here's the problem. The moment you do that, you're, you're well, I mean, I, the problem's obvious, and I'm sure most of you get this already, but the moment you do that, you have thrown open the floodgates because you've said it's not just multiple timelines, it's infinite timelines at that point. Because at what point in time did Link die? How many times did Link die? How many different instances are there where there was no hero? How many... It, I'm probably failing to explain this, but having there just suddenly be another timeline which is generated out of the blue with no impetus or input from the player and no character explanation whatsoever other than, oh, by the way, we needed a third timeline, doesn't actually fit at all with the pre-established ways that time travel works within the series. And it's funny because there's only really time travel in this one game. All the rest of the Zelda series has basically avoided it, other than the fact that there's the two timelines. Also, if I may be so bold, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stop ranting about it. It's just stupid. I'm just leaving it there. <sighs> Whatever. <laughs> um... I will say this, it's partially a byproduct of the fact that they didn't plan this out to begin with. And at least they've admitted that. The original Zeldas were never really intended to uh, connect to each other. They were just separate tales, you know, like the Final Fantasies were originally. And it's ironically the same problem because the Final Fantasies have since been tried to be tied together and kind of failed because they didn't do it originally, so it doesn't actually make sense. It's the same thing with the Zeldas. Some of them don't actually coherently tie in together. That being said, of course... Uh, Ocarina of Time leads pretty well into Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, and another game which we'll be looking at next week, which I'm a little worried about actually, Majora's Mask. So I'll see you next time, guys.